What I want to do this channel is interview people who have totally different opinions from my own. And to stick to that commitment, I'm today interviewing here in Holland Park, uh, Peter Hitchens. Now, Peter Hitchens, in lots of ways, is a, is a kind of standard bearer for the uh, socially conservative right in this country. He writes for the Mail on Sunday. Do we have any common ground? I suspect he will surprise you with some of his beliefs and ideas. I'm, I'm very optimistic. And kind of hope drives what I believe in. This you sense, poor thing. Well, this is what I want to talk to you about, you see, because I think despite... What a miserable the, life you must despite, be. Well, we'll see, you know, I'll have, I'll have a life of disappointment, I'm sure. But a lot of the stuff you write about, you've got the passion for your beliefs, but you seem completely defeatist. You don't think... Well, I relax. I, I realise that, 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 that the, in the evening of my days, which I've now pretty much reached, oh, I realise that I have. Kind of daft. I, the, I, I realise that, that most of these struggles are futile, that they aren't, you know, even where they succeed, and I, I hope to some, to some extent that your, your utopia doesn't come about because you will hate it when it arrives. Not a utopia. Okay, well, a mild utopia, I hope it's a <laughs> semi-utopia, whatever it is. I hope, that, I hope that your ideals aren't fulfilled because you will be the person most disappointed in it. In what way? What do you mean? Well, because it will, never, it will not work out the way you thought it would. It's, it's perfectly, it's, it's absolutely true that it's better to travel, hopefully, than to arrive. Jeremy Corbyn is Jeremy Corbyn. obviously standing to be leader of the Labour Party. He's unexpectedly gone from, I don't know, 200 to 1 to being the front runner. This is very funny, isn't it? What's happened? It's an awful lot of people sick of being told what to do. And I also think it's because of the observable fact that the Blairite project originated in the kitchens and pantries of Eurocommunism has now been taken over by the Conservative Party. Uh, and therefore has you know, has no need of the Labour Party to continue it. The Labour Party has been freed of its of, of, it, of its need to be Blairite anymore. So it's left a and vacuum. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's oh. in some ways it's a sort of spasm of all right then we're free, free at last, we can do this. As the as all the Blairite media and the David Milibands and the Peter Peter Mandelson come crowding in to say don't do this, <laughs> the impulse to say well if. He says, don't do it. That's absolutely what I must do. Just grows stronger and stronger, doesn't it? They become the I campaign It's a managers. very good demonstration that we still have a strong national sense of humour. You used to be a Trotskyist for a while. I certainly was. Yeah. You were in the International Socialist, which, for people who don't know, is the forerunner of the Socialist Workers' Party. Yeah. And this was more than a flirtation. You were a true believer for a while. Oh, very much so, yeah. I thought that Marxism and Leninism had pretty much the answer to uh, the problems of the world, yeah. How do you look back at that now, given where you well, stand? Well, it was a reasonable mistake to have made. Unlike people, unlike people who've been vaccinated against a disease, I've actually had the disease, and therefore I'm <laughs> totally immune from it in a way that a mere vaccination couldn't possibly provide. People, again, you call yourself a moral and social conservative, yeah. and unapologetically so, but you're not a Tory. In fact, you're very hostile to the modern Tories. Yeah. Why? Because it calls itself the Conservative Party. If it called itself the Socialist Workers' Party, I wouldn't have anything against it. It's not, so, it's not a left-wing it's not, party. It is a left-wing party. It's egalitarian. It's got much more in common with the SWP than it has with the Conservatives. Do you think the... Uh... I, mean, I often hear <laughs> David Cameron wow. and, and George Osborne coming out with things which I used to say when I was a trot. Well, let's think but about The difference this. is that I knew when I said them that they were Trotskyist things to say. They have no idea. They, they, they are left-wing, but they don't know they're left-wing. But do you think... Which Trump... is even more alarming in some ways. At least Jeremy Corbyn knows he's left-wing. You've called for the breakup of the Conservative Party before. Do you stand? Well, by I that? hope that it, I, I hope that it would break up. I, I simply underestimated the enormous power of lies and money, mm. uh, which enabled the Conservative Party to to obtain a victory in in the elections. There was no national trend. What there was was a fantastically clever, well targeted, very costly campaign by the Conservatives in targeted constituencies, which won them a technical mm. victory on points. Which they didn't. It wasn't a moral victory. Nobody really won that election morally, but it was, it, it was quite sufficient for them to form a majority government and it was more effective than they thought it would be. How would you sum up David Cameron and what he stands for? I don't think he stands for anything. I think he stands for obtaining office for the sons of gentlemen. He's <laughs> jolly good at it. He's quite likeable. I've not, I, don't, I can't feel any passion against him. It's impossible. I, mean, it's, I feel passion against a blancmange. A perfectly nice chap, I'm sure, but his, he has absolutely no interest in changing anything. He has a great deal of interest in maintaining things as they are and in being in office while they're maintained. So a lot of people don't realise you support, for example, you'd prefer public ownership of the railways, for example. Immediately, yeah. The intervention of the state in a lot of areas is essential. You can't, you can manage without it. Even the most, I mean, there are wild conservative, well, liberal free marketeers 
who say that you wouldn't, you don't need a navy. It could be done by sort of privateers, but it's obviously ridiculous. You, you, every state has to intervene in something, and if you once you've decided you can, you, you, you must intervene by creating a navy, then you've pretty much sold the principle, haven't you? The state's obviously useful sometimes. You used to be a non-believer. Yes. Now you're Christian. Your religious convictions, do you see that as very much the underlying kind of basis of your political position? It has to be the basis of any position. I, I'm, I'm troubled by anybody who doesn't have a religious opinion of any kind. A set of opinions without a religious yeah. underpinning uh, would be like a house without yeah. foundation. I mean, with your brother, obviously, um, you two you're both you know, huge figures in your own right. And what, growing up, what was your relationship? Oh, adversarial. <laughs> we were not close enough to be, uh, we weren't twins or anything like that, to be the good friends that siblings sometimes can be. We weren't far enough apart to be wholly independent of each other, so we were fighting for the same territory a lot of the time. Did anyone bully anyone? Or was it, it wasn't like that? Was I don't know, with the word bullying these days has so many applications. He was bigger than I was, but I like to think I could hit quite hard. <laughs> sure you did. But he was very good at pretending that I hadn't hurt him. I mean, after, after he died, how did you fit, in terms of, his followers, I suppose. Do you make a distinction between those, you know, the way he's been portrayed and the brother you actually? Oh, the know? fan, the fanboys are impossible. They, they, they have, they have absolutely, obviously have absolutely no idea what kind of person he was. I, I only realised it when I went and did that dreadful debate with him at Grand Rapids, Michigan. They didn't hate me because they, because because of any anything uh -huh. personal. They hated me because they'd come to see Christopher, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and they couldn't work out what I was doing there. It was like going to see the big movie and finding you had to sit through a B picture for for half an hour first. As it dawned on me what was actually going on, that Christopher had become a rock star, I could see why it was, uh, my presence was completely superfluous. It must have felt surreal to you to be in a situation like that. You're with your brother and you're there surrounded by his fan base who are very hostile to you. Well, they became more hostile to me as the more they knew who I was and okay. what I thought, the more hostile they became. To begin with, it was just, what is this guy doing here? As the evening went on, it was, what is this guy doing here? And we hate him. I mean, it comes across sometimes, you, 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 see, you see yourself as you're surrounded in this kind of socially liberal mix, you know, this well, kind I of, am. and you're this kind of lone voice well, trying I, to speak they, out against I don't know about alone, but there aren't that many of us. Well, the Conservative government, they've introduced a tax break for married couples. That's the sort of moral and social... It's a token. What actually needs to be done for marriage uh, is to reprivilege it in, in, in far greater ways. The real blow struck in marriage was struck in all major Western societies in the 1960s by the introduction of what was, in effect, no-fault divorce. There is absolutely no suggestion, there has been none since the 1960s in any major political party, that, that the introduction of that form of divorce was a mistake. Do you think the fact a woman and a woman or a man and a man can marry has any impact on your no, life? No, I think it's I think it's a side effect of it. I think it's I, I, I think that it's uh, it's it's a consequence of the collapse of heterosexual marriage. And I I regret now getting involved in the argument about same-sex marriage because it was a, it was a Stalingrad a diversion. Why is one worrying about a few thousand people who want to have same-sex marriages while not being concerned at all about the collapse of heterosexual marriage? which involves millions of people and millions of children. I mean, it used to be more acceptable to be publicly prejudiced about gay people, about women, about people who aren't white. Isn't it a good thing that it's now less acceptable? Yeah, unequivocally a good thing, yeah. Because you talk about political correctness, isn't that all that I talk really about is? political correctness and I, and I am ambivalent about political correctness. I always make the point, say, the reason why it has been such an effective weapon is that it's based most fundamentally on getting people to behave with good manners towards other people. It's its other implications where it moves into making certain things unsayable and therefore certain thoughts unthinkable, where it becomes a malign thing. What are the main threats you see it, as you see it, threatening this country? Oh, it's, it's no question of threats. I mean, it's finished. It's not. Do you really think this is your pessimism coming through again? Finished. I mean, why I, is it, I've why never is seen it finished? a country more finished. We are bankrupt, non-sovereign, uh, robbed of our, of our culture and our past. We have no power uh, to save ourselves. The next proper history of this country will be written in Chinese. Finally, do you have any optimism whatsoever about the future of Britain and what it could become? No. Why? Why should I? I mean, ridiculous. I mean, if, if, I, if I turn out to be wrong, it'll be a pleasant surprise. If I turn out to be right, I'll be prepared for it. So pretty bleak. Yeah.
in between the crisis and the catastrophe, we may as well have a glass of champagne. Yeah. But I, it is not... I can't do that. I'll be called a champagne socialist, but you, you feel well, free. I don't suppose that's really much of an insult anymore, is it? <laughs> I thought it was the Tories who weren't allowed to drink champagne. Maybe not, I don't know. I've, got, I've had words. It's George Osborne's rule. Look, it's been, it's been an absolute pleasure. You're a gentleman as ever. So great to see Peter. Let me see. I told you he'd surprise us. He does have beliefs and ideas you wouldn't quite expect him to have. He is pretty pessimistic though, as you can see. But it was a pleasure meeting him and chatting to him. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as well. We've got lots of other interviews kicking about. Keep the comments coming and subscribe to the channel. I'll see you next time.